Hey everyone, welcome to CS Education View uh, Zoo number three, and uh, we've got a, a, a brand new like intro bumper thing that has uh, title splash v two dot png that Steve came up with, and it's it's really amazing, and uh, so so our production is really going through the roof now. <laughs> uh, and with that amazing intro, I'm going to let Steve uh, <laughs> introduce our guest for the day. <laughs> Thank you, Will. Uh, I'm Steve Wolfman uh, with the CS Education Zoo, and I'm really happy today to have uh, Dr. Jeffrey Forbes as a guest. Uh, Jeff is an associate professor of the practice with Duke University Computer Science, and he's currently on leave at the National Science Foundation in the U.S. Uh, I'm in Canada, by the way, that's why I say in the U.S., uh, as program director for the Education and Workforce Cluster in the Division of Computer and Network Systems, Directorate for Computer and Information Science and Engineering. Um, since Jeff does work as an officer of the NSF, I want to emphasize emphasize that he's here with us today as a private citizen interested in CS education, not as a representative of the NSF or the federal government or even Duke University. Uh, besides CS education, Jeff's also interested in research on intelligent agents and social information processing. And uh, other than that, I mostly want to hand it off to Jeff. Uh, Jeff, you mind if I start you off with a question? Sure can. All right. Um, so one of the things I wanted to ask you is what you see as promising directions for CS education, maybe in the big picture or maybe just small things, um, in the coming years. Uh, thanks, Steve. And also, well, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I'm really excited about this, and I like the idea of the zoo. Uh, I am also curious, by the way, of what V1 of the image was. <laughs> oh, you don't Do, see it. Do you really want to see? Yeah, I, I would love to know. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here. Something that was of higher quality that you or well, I don't know. Okay, since you asked, you're gonna get it. Oh no. <laughs> uh, here, here is uh, uh, this is V1. Oh, yeah. You can, you can see the fangs on Steve there. <laughs> yeah, but there's not a lot of bird happening. Yeah. No, there's very little bird, so that had to had to get rid of that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but right. yes, education. <laughs> yeah. So, um, there are one of the great things that's been happening uh, at NSF, and just well, not it's just in general. I've found so for the past three years, I've been up in DC area. That there's so much interest in STEM education broadly, but in computer science education specifically. Right. I think there are a lot of factors that are coming together at the same time. You know, there's the fact that, once again, computer science seems to be reasonably popular. Industry cares a lot about computer science education all of a sudden. And uh, all of a sudden, parents are even, parents and schools care. So one of the things I think that um, really I'm, so I guess part of that there's so much interest in all of a sudden measuring what we're doing, right? It used to be the case that I feel like a lot of what we did in teaching was based on really good ideas, right? Really good ideas and whether something really resonated with people and how did it make you feel. And as computer science education gets to this new level where all of a sudden that we're uh, going into schools across the country, and that um, there's this higher level of uh, assessments that, that's expected even at the college level. At this point, we're seeing that it can't just be enough to say, well, I think Java is a better language than, like, that, you know, starting your first course in Java when you're students does not seem like a statement you can just come out and say and uh, without any evidence for. So one of the big things is I, I think the idea of evidence base is sometimes overstated because it can be very hard to get something that counts as evidence in the education literature. But nevertheless, I think what we're seeing right now is a big shift in trying to test out your pet theory of is this really going to affect teaching and learning of computer science. So I think that's pretty exciting, is that you get people who otherwise didn't care about computer science caring a lot more, so the education research people will care. And at the same time, I think 
people from computer science care a lot more about the education side. Um, that's a small thing about MOOCs, for example, is that more than anything else, all these massively open online courses have made it so that faculty who previously you know, taught their classes, did the best job they could, now are asking really interesting questions about what students actually learn and what the right way students to learn in courses is. Right? It's kind of funny that it's taking online courses to get people thinking about whether anyone learned anything in my lecture, right? <laughs> Before it was sort of like, yeah, I'm lecturing, students are probably learning something. Now, in response to, uh, you know, now people are saying, well, people don't learn anything in MOOCs. Well, then the MOOC people come back and say, well, they don't learn anything in your lecture either. <laughs> so <laughs> the idea is now we're trying to make lectures that actually make a difference, right? That if I'm going to, in, in the time I've been gone from Duke, our enrollments have gone up quite a bit. I hope that's mostly coincidental. <laughs> and I have at least some evidence that it is by looking at national trends. Um, but now... I'm coming back from you, know, instead of teaching a class of, say, 50 people, now I'm going to teach a class of, like, 200 or 300 people, right? I mean, it's, there are other things happening in terms of we took two courses, combined them into one, but still, our courses have, in, the enrollments have increased significantly. And that means that I need to think more about how we can actually reach those students, because I don't think it's, you're not going to be able to do things like, well, if someone didn't get in a lecture, I'm just going to meet with every student and figure out how to get them to understand it in one-on-one -on -one office hours, right? You need to think about the structure of your course a lot more than you did previously. Are the, what are some of the lessons you think have been learned from the MOOCs in terms of how, how to make the teaching more effective? So I think uh, there are a few lessons there. Um, one is this whole idea where you enter, uh, where you, instead of you know lecturing for a long time and having uh, some assessment at some point, the idea that you interleave assessments with the uh, course material itself, and you do that regularly. Um, assessment is a big thing, right? It, and it turns out that assessment actually helps engagement. People think of quizzes as being this painful thing. Um, Andy Coe at uh, Washington has this project um, about social debugging. And one of the things they found was that when they incorporated quizzes, like assessments, into uh, the task, that people engaged for longer than if you didn't have some kind of quizzes. And besides the fact that also quizzes let you know that you, know, you are actually doing something, right? that you are actually learning something, and lets the faculty know or the instructor know that the students are learning something. So I think um, assessments along with feedback and fast feedback. Um, my new thing that I said, there's one thing I'm going to take back to my course uh, in the fall. It's that fast feedback, all, things, all other things being equal, fast feedback is really important. Fast feedback is better than good feedback. That is slow, right? If, your choice is between I turn in an assignment and then immediately or that day I get something back saying, here is a accurate but not particularly precise uh, assessment of your work. That basically you did a good job, you passed most of the test cases, you satisfied, you know, your code is reasonable if it's like a programming assignment. If you can get that back immediately, that's really useful. In comparison, to me pouring over your code for like three weeks and then send you back a nice email saying, here's, wh here's why you know, this part of your code could be improved, here's why this. Having that feedback is nice, but it turns out that it's not nearly as functional as getting something back immediately that says, oh, here's what I did wrong, here's what I need to change it. Yeah, that's, that's something we changed when I was at Indiana University. In the introductory programming language classes. We used to have a, a very heavyweight system where the teaching assistants would grade all of the homework assignments as, as carefully as possible and then hand feedback, you know, hand them back. And then the problem was that over the semester, that, that 
it would take longer and longer time, time periods for that to happen. And finally, we went to a system where the grades were either didn't submit, which was a zero, unsuccessful, which meant that they just didn't understand the concepts at all or, you know, did only part of the assignment. Uh, and then there was successful, with, um, I think we had successful minus, successful, and successful plus. So, you know, if you did the assignment, you get a successful or an S. If you did something really outstanding beyond when you get an S plus, if you're kind of on the edge, you get an S minus. So almost all the grades were either S minus, S, or S plus. And, you know, some of the students didn't like it because they wanted, you know, like an exact numeric grade, but yep. it meant that we could grade them and give them back right away. And, and then... The most, the main thing is that the students who are really having trouble and really didn't understand it, they got feedback right away. Yep, exactly. And I think that's particularly important for students who are struggling. You'd be surprised how much they don't know about why they're struggling or that they are struggling. Right? And so giving them quick feedback to say, hey, you think you know what you're doing, but you actually have these misconceptions here, 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 or even if we can't identify the misconceptions, knowing you're just not getting it right is really, really important. So, yeah, that was a... And, yeah, so, and I think people are often stray away from doing this because they think, well, that's not... They might be willing to do it at a low-level course, but not at, like, a programming language course, but it turns out that even at higher-level courses, getting that quick feedback really helps. Um, and... I guess the other thing I've learned is a surprising number of relatively have surprisingly little impact. <laughs> that you can replace um, that you can replace a whole course sometimes with just we're just going to give you the assignments and a final exam and we'll have no instruction whatsoever and you'd be surprised how well many <laughs> students will do. Right? And that's, it's a little disconcerting, right, that, you know, I really like teaching. I think it's an incredibly important thing to do. It's, you know, what I've dedicated my life to. But I, in some ways, right, you know, so much of what happens in our courses is because of, you know, the students, right? It's what the students do and what the students' goals are and... We can help guide them, but so much of it is directed and really managed by them. So, so you haven't got a chance to, to teach class lately because you've been in NSF, right? Yes. So you go back. You're going to do lots more frequent assessments. Uh, you're still probably going to have hope. time. Okay. You're still probably going to have time where you're standing in front of students, right? What What is the valuable thing to do with that then when you're not assessing them? So it's an interesting question. Um, so there are a number of things I'm going to do differently. Um, one is it's surprising how much I've always, this is going to make it sound funny, but I've always kind of avoided mixing too much of saying why this is important to me, right? I try to put things out there objectively that this is, you know, really, a, you know, that we're just studying this, but it turns out the enthusiasm thing, why this is important to you, that apparently conveys to students, right? That <laughs> this idea that this is incredibly important or that this is incredibly exciting will actually make some, some difference to the students. I think from a motivation point of view, that makes it a difference. Um, I'm going to... So one of the great things about working at SF is, you know, you get to talk to lots of people because everyone likes talking to you because, well, you hand out money and such. <laughs> um, but also, uh, you just, and so you get to meet a lot of the people in the computer science education community. So I'm going to, uh, so one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to borrow from uh, Christine Alvarado at UCSD. She has a very, you know, she has a big class out of 300, 400 students. But she mails every single student in her course at midterm uh, saying, hey, how, uh, you know, I see how you're doing in the course. Um, I, you know, you kind of, you know, are having trouble here. Come visit me, do this and that. Like, it turns out that some of those personal things, 
I hope I didn't just, you know, put Christine out there and one of her students is going to find out that that letter that they got from her it was not just for <laughs> uh, not just for her. That she sent it to everyone in the script. But that said, it's still a personalized script. Um, I, I, I think that's something I'm definitely going to do more of is try to understand where the students are, in particular, work more with the students who are struggling. I think um, I spent, all of us care a lot about the students who are struggling in the course, but I think you end up spending more of, I spend, a, a, I did not spend a lot of my time necessarily talking to the students who are struggling, unless they were struggling and in my office all the time. Right? If they were struggling and in the office all the time or having some other problem, then I would see them. But it was much more of a um, – so I, I want to do a little more, pull, uh, I guess, pushing as opposed to just hoping they're going to come to me. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's one thing I'm going to do. Uh, another thing I'm going to do is uh, – one more. I'm going to be doing really interesting work at a lot. Um, that is very uh, – many of us, when we're teaching our courses, before you have what your colleagues did in your department, then you have you know colleagues that you have at different universities who you think about. But there is a very wide range of people who are doing really interesting work, especially if you're talking about the course we'll be teaching in the fall is our, you know, our second course, our data structures type course, which – Basically, many, many schools have a similar course, if not nearly all schools. So I feel that there's a lot I can learn and a lot that can be adapted from other people's courses, with attribution, obviously, um, and that would really help um, because it, I guess another thing I've seen is there's sometimes a desire that people have to just develop something at their own institution just because they want to do their own thing. And sometimes it's really useful to adapt things which have been shown to actually practices which are actually shown to work rather than just develop your own because you want to have your own stamp on it. Uh, going. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was like, does that give you an example of what I might want to do? Yeah, that's that's great. Um, I guess, Will, can I just do a quick follow up there? Yeah, please. Do. So, um, so you're going to do a lot of adapting from from other people's courses. I I find that, I, may, maybe because I I am the sort of person who wants to make everything myself at my own institution. I I just find it really hard to adapt other people's stuff. I, I guess it it actually comes back to the enthusiasm thing that you said, right? When it's somebody else's stuff, I feel really awkward. And so, can can you speak to that briefly? So yeah, so that's a really good point because it actually turns out that it's sometimes harder work to adapt someone else's work because in order to take it, you need to do more than just um, take their lectures and then go with it because you don't know why they're doing what they why they made the choices they did and you can't put in your stories of how this relates to you. Like for example, you know if when I do Steve's numerical pest, I can never pronounce it, prestigitation assignment. Prest numerical magic, how about that? Let's just call it that. Um, that assignment. I can talk about it. I, I can talk about Benford's Law. I can do all these cool things, but I'm sure it doesn't have the same, I, I don't have the same relationship with it that Steve does when he came up with it. So, yes, I think that's a problem. And if I were to advocate for something, something we've worked on a little bit at NSF, is thinking about, so if we have these online platforms and there's going to be more sharing, which is a big if, one thing that would be nice is rather than if I want to use your assignment, I can get like, I can get the write-up of the assignment and perhaps a little bit of code. Instead, wouldn't it be great if I could more or less go into my my edX or whatever system our university uses, and I could type import numerical prestigitation, 
and then I have not just the assignment, I have the assignment, I have how it's graded, I have the auto grading part, I have the lectures, I have the um, uh, material that why this is kind of cool and you know links to uh, recent articles of how people have been caught uh, committing fraud because they made up numbers that are you know because they thought that all numbers appeared equally like equally likely uh, all, all digits excuse me appeared uh, with equal probability that would be cool um, but to answer your original question I think what it takes is just time right uh, I think where I run into problems is that I adapt things from other people at the last, if you adapt something from someone else at the last minute, it's very hard to also adapt to get it into your system such that, ah, I get this, I understand why it's cool and my relationship to it. If you adapt it with lots of time, so for example, what I've done this summer is I've done some of Kevin Wayne's assignments, then it's like, oh yeah, I had this problem when I went through the assignment, and that's something I feel like you can relate uh, to students. Uh, students are interested in hearing your uh, troubles as well sometimes. Thanks, that, that really helps. Uh, so Will, I'll, I'll hand off to you for the next question. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, going back to your first question, you know, you're saying that one of the changes in computer science education that you see happening is, um, I guess, more <laughs> thinking about things like, well, why are we picking Java as a programming language, right? Let's try to justify that some more. Uh, an argument I hear a lot, or a discussion I hear a lot, things like introductory programming languages, is, is not necessarily about what language is easiest to, for students to learn. It's more like what languages are being used in industry, how will they find a job, how will they find an internship, will they be able to do research with other professors? And that's why you know one reason I hear you know Java being taught a lot or Python or you know, C sharp or something like that. Um, you know, what what to what extent you to what extent do you think that's an important consideration or do you think that you know four year uh, colleges and universities should should try to stick more to uh, sort of a, a more of a pure of an edu pure educational um, you know approach at least in the beginning years. So that's a really good question. I, I think the answer, of course, is it depends, right? Depends on the audience. There's this really large and growing audience, which is the people who want to use, who want to take a computer science course or a computing course so that they can take the problems that they have in their discipline and be able to do something smart about it, right? Um, if I'm a social scientist, if I'm a sociologist, I'm an, I'm, I'm an economics major, or whatever, and I've got some data, I should be able to do something smarter than you know just put it in Excel and hoping I can do everything I need to. With the tools that are out there and with the libraries that are out there, there's so much we can do. And there, it is actually important to give them some reasonably, right, because you don't want to give, if your whole point is, this course is going to help you, the um, the scientist, engineer, or whoever you are, actually do something with the data that you care about. Well, it should at least link into some libraries that you might actually use in real life, right? So, um, so that's so. I think there are times we get caught up in the abstractions and what the right way of designing a big system might be or the right principles there might be if you're going to reason about or make proofs about something, which I, as a computer scientist, find fascinating, but might not be quite as fascinating to the biologist who just has a huge stream of genome data that they just want to deal with. Okay, so that's one thing. And then there's the um, idea that we need to be, that if I'm a computer science student, part of why I'm interested in computer science, now this is going to change, we hope, over time, but part of what you hear from students, 
of why they're interested in computer science is they want to kind of join the profession in some ways. It's just in the same way that if you uh, take a civil engineering course, there is some idea that I'm going to someday be a practical, uh, uh, practicing civil engineering, and I want to use the tools that are authentic to that discipline. We've, our big initiative has been the CS10K initiative, right? We're trying to get, this is focused on high school, trying to really rethink high school education in the US, um, high school computer science education that is, um, getting 10,000 well-prepared teachers teaching and engaging academic rigorous computer science in 10,000 schools by the year 2016 or so. Um, and one of the, we wanted to, engaging is a very important part of that. And most of the approaches there are not using industrial strength languages, like far from it. They're using languages like Scratch or Alice or et cetera. And we do get some comments from some teachers that say that some students aren't interested in taking those courses because they are not viewed as being uh, the what they're going to do, what their friends tell them industry is like. And so there is this idea that you want, that if something is not viewed as authentic, you are going to have a hard time attracting many, some, some students. Now I say that that's, I feel like, a transition we're going to because if we're successful with the CS10K, we're going to get a whole lot more students in the field, or a whole lot more students who have taken, not necessarily in the field, but who have taken a computer science course in high school. And that's going to change what happens at the college level significantly because you're going to have a lot more students who've had some experience with computer science who have been, where it's been introduced not as computer science as something that you do so that you can get a job coding at Google, right? If what you want to do is get a job at Google, then yes, you want to make sure that at some point you're getting an industrial strength language because otherwise it might be hard to get a job there in some cases. So, but I do think that's going to change. And one of our goals with this whole CS10K project is explicitly that we don't want it to be the case that you have like, we don't want to turn into some weird version of math where you have like the people who are going to be computer science majors who are like the elite few who like know all like who get very deep into the subject and then you have all the people who are just like computer science appreciators who have taken like one course and but can't really do much with it right the, the idea is supposed to be that by bringing everyone up to some level that a lot more people are going to go into the discipline right because we have bats of data that say that it's not just that we're not getting enough people, we're not getting the best people into computer science, and we're trying to fix that. So we're hoping that by giving a broader introduction, and also a broader introduction meaning that computer science is about more than languages, and it's more about more than programming, that will hopefully make a big difference in terms of who goes in. So. In the end, I think languages do matter because people are being, students are being brought into sort of a profession and they want it to be, to be authentic. But on the other hand, I think programming languages are a really, really bad educational interfa interface. Um, they are not designed for I mean, they're not designed pedagogically, nor I mean, one could argue they shouldn't have been designed pedagogically, but that they're, they're certainly not. So uh, because of that, I think you can imagine down the road that perhaps we might have something entirely different for um, learning computing, or learning computer science, and then perhaps switch people into uh, industrial languages just so, uh, just for the purpose of you know compatibility. That said, we teach 
Python and Java in our courses. <laughs> <laughs> That's the part I was waiting for. <laughs> so, you can so and, and that I imagine if someone came up to us tomorrow and said, "Hey, you, you know, here's this great pedagogical language," we would say, "Heck no." <laughs> All hey. right, so so uh, we we've been talking about some heavy stuff here. I've got a question I like to ask everybody. Can I throw that in and maybe lighten things a little? Please. All right. So um, this this is sort of the generalization of the what book should every computer scientist read? What what's something you think every computer scientist should read or learn or do or play with? Just something we shouldn't be without. Hmm. Every computer scientist should read or learn or do something about. Um. So I, I guess I'd have a couple answers to this. Um, one is uh, that I think everyone, I'm sort of surprised myself to some, to some extent in saying this, uh, because I didn't like it when I had to go through it, but I, I was a graduate student at Berkeley, and I TA the uh, Abelson and Sussman course, you know, their intro, the structured interpretation of computer programs. I do not think that that is the right way of doing things, right? I honestly do not. I do think everyone should read it, right? I think everyone should check it out, because it gives you a nice and interesting counterpoint. I think the claims that are, in fact, I, I think we can, there's actually evidence that some of the claims are not right, right? So one of the claims of why they had that approach was because they thought, well, you get a lot of students coming in who already know Java and Python. This levels the playing field. It turns out that that's just not true, right? It turns out that uh, Colleen Lewis did a study on this, and it turns out that, yeah, the students with more programming experience did better, and you can, I think even subject to how they did later, right, that the, uh, the students with more programming experience did better in that intro course because, you know, you're learning a lot of things in addition to figuring out where, you know, what car and cutter are and what, uh, and how many parentheses you need to put places. So that's, I think, but I think just the idea that everything can be done in mean, functional, uh, functional languages are so powerful, the idea of why mapping something is so useful. Um, so that's something I think everyone should do. And similarly, I think uh, understanding a little, the thing I wish I had done more of in, when I was a college student long, long ago was learn more about probability. It would have been awfully useful to um, have, a, so not so I didn't have to learn it during graduate school. So in addition, Everyone's a great uh, early paper. Um, Meron Sahami wrote on uh, um, spam filtering, just using you know naive Bayes spam filtering. Totally cool idea. Ab absolutely still works today in a lot of ways. Like you know, obviously they've added lots of bells and whistles onto it, but just uh, that's something I would do. I'd also encourage people to read, um, Jane Margolis has a number of really good books. Um, there's Unlocking the Clubhouse and um, uh, Stuck in the Shallow, which I would encourage people to read, or at least read summaries of, to understand why people don't go into computer science, even when in some cases, they are interested, but just have not had the experiences that allow them to come into college and do well in those courses. And or similarly, where they come in and are turned away because of the experiences they have in those courses. I think what we do in our courses and the culture in our courses does matter. And I think those books really address that. So that, that's my 
off the cuff answer. <laughs> Great, that's uh, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I thought of one, and I actually thought of Jane first, but then I thought of oh yeah, but in terms of yeah, but then I went back to structured interpretation of computer programming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've taught um, not SICP, but I, I've taught something a little similar because at Indiana, when I was, I was at Indiana for 10 years, and I basically got my PhD in Scheme. And, you know, that's yeah. a very big Scheme scheme. So all the intro courses were taught in Scheme. Wow. And my, my experience was a little, a little different. My, my experience was that um, some of the students who had had prior programming experience did really well. Some of the students who were used to programming with sort of a C model with side effects everywhere, yep. uh, some of those students did worse than the students, like significantly worse than the students who had never programmed before because they, they were not programming in the right paradigm for, for the language or the course or whatever. And, and, that, and that's, in that sense, I, um, it was kind of hit or miss. So, so some of the very best students we had had prior programming experience, and then some of the students who really were struggling there was one student I had who uh, uh, he did fine. He had, he had programmed in C for several years. He did fine well on all the recursive uh, programs because I didn't show set bang or any of the side effects. And then later in the course, I introduced one side affecting operator, set cutter bang, so you could set the value on list. And he instantly realized, hey, I can program in C now. <laughs> and he started wrapping all of his arguments in lists, even if they didn't. He would start wrapping numbers in lists so he could set cutter bang them and stuff like that. And he didn't get a right, you, you basically didn't get anything right for the rest of the semester, even though he'd been doing fine before. So, so that's yeah. the uh, student who I think doesn't do well. Yeah, uh, but yeah, yeah, I agree. It's not. It's definitely not completely level. Yeah, and I, I, I agree. And I, I had a. I remember having some, not maybe not quite as extreme, but some similar experiences. And this could be also a specific thing about Berkeley, and could be that like you know the fact that you've used, that you've programmed before means that doing something like say using Emacs will not make you will not make you cry, right? <laughs> you know, I, I do think I try to remember as when I'm teaching how much really small things which are now utterly trivial to me were so challenging to, to me back then. And I've found that that's becoming more in some ways because like the idea of a file and directories and all this kind of stuff that's that's not exactly something that's native to students anymore. <laughs> this idea that okay, well, this is in this directory and this works because it was in this directory, but doesn't mean that is not how your iPhone works, right? Your iPhone doesn't care what directory something's in, right? <laughs> so uh, I think that's also so remembering that is probably useful. Will, do you want to take the next one, or you want me to uh, to keep going? Oh, uh, let's see. Well, one question I had, and I just felt like I had to ask this because I, from looking at your CV and your background, you had done some work on on the autonomous robotics, or it seemed like autonomous vehicles, or things like that. Oh uh, yes, a long and I just, I mean, obviously that's that's something that's extremely. Uh, Hot these days. And I was just curious if you know this isn't necessarily direct, directly related to CS education, but it could be. I'm just kind of curious, sort of what your background in that is, and what how you see the future of that happening. And also for students who are interested in that sort of thing, what would you recommend that they they learn or study in order to get into that field? So that's a good question. So yeah, that I my uh, PhD thesis was on uh, uh, learning. Basically, cars that would learn how to drive from trial and error exp experience, but this was trial and error experience, so therefore it was all in simulation. Um, <laughs> it turns out that uh, the state of California does not like you crashing cars all left and right. Um, but um, so yeah, that's what I worked on for my thesis, and it was really interesting, right? Because it brought in so many different things um, at the time and. California was particularly interested in 
intelligent vehicle and highway systems. Right? And uh, the it was also an interesting way of thinking about how engineers, engineers like electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, think about a problem compared to how computer scientists were thinking about a problem. At the time, the electrical engineers were and mechanical engineers were thinking about platoons, where you'd have, and this idea is coming back, where you have cars driving down the freeway really close to each other, right? But they had limited smarts because, um, well, engineering smarts is very hard, right? So instead, basically, they just have radar, which tells you how far the car is in front of you. And if you drive very close to the car in front of you, it actually turns out that it should be relatively safe because um, when you have an accident, the accident will be at relatively low relative speed, right? If you're both driving 65 and one driving 64, it turned out that, that was wrong because <laughs> that if you had an accident, that it could, there were certain cases where the accident could get bigger as it proceeded down the platoon. Hopefully they've solved that problem by now, but that was why they killed that project. Anyway, so we were working on something. So my, so we were supposed to figure out how to make a car that could drive. And I decided to do machine learning because, well, it was really hard for me to write a program to make a car drive, uh, a, a car even in simulation, do what it was supposed to do. There's so many things to think about. So that was pretty cool. And probability came in here left and right, right? Because um, what we were on um, was really a, everything in the world is uncertain, right? Your sensors that we were just using cameras, now they have laser rangefinders, but it still doesn't matter. You're always going to be getting back uncertain information. And more importantly, it's also important to know the intentions of other drivers. Um, and the intentions of other drivers is that's hidden to you entirely. So it was all about modeling traffic behavior, right? So you had to model the traffic state and then model what your, what your actions, what effect your actions would have on the, uh, the traffic state. So um, that's what I did. And um, there are a lot of technical details. Like it turns out when you drive, when you're learning to drive, uh, the most common case is drive straight. <laughs> and it turns out if you drive for a very long time, you know what you learn to do? You learn to drive straight. So there are cases where you drive straight, straight, straight for a long time, a curve comes, and you drive straight off that curve. <laughs> because all those examples of driving straight <laughs> make you forget about driving on curves. <laughs> so um, um, that was the problem. So what would I tell someone to learn? So that's where the probability came in, because so much of it was stick inference and figuring out how to how to model the state and how to make actions under uncertainty. Because no matter what happens, you're never going to have perfect sensors, um, and you certainly aren't going to know the intentions of other drivers. Um, I look forward to the day where I don't have to drive and I can just get in the car and tell it where to go. Um, and more over, oh, I guess, I look forward to that happening for other people because we, we spend a long time, uh, I spend a long time talking to the mechanical engineers and civil engineers about traffic. And it turns out traffic is because of human beings, right? It's because of rubbernecking. Like that. when people like see a famous person on the side of the road or an accident and they look to the side that causes traffic, causes billions of dollars worth of uh, accidents. It's just ridiculous. So autonomous cars can't come fast enough as far as I'm concerned. OK, so uh, we've got a question from the audience for you now. I'm going to hand off to Dutch. Yeah, so I have a, uh, can you hear me? First? Yep. Yep. Um, I have a, a bit of a broad question. I, mm -hmm. I think we can probably agree that a lot of good programming is effective communication within a team. So as we broaden access to computer science education, yep. do you think there's any risk in losing some of the shared cultural context that 
helps bind a programming team together that you would traditionally get with a four-year program in small class sizes. I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about that. Maybe it's a bad thing. Maybe it's a good thing. No, no. I, I think it's. I think it's interesting. I think you are unquestionably going to get different teams in this world. One. I, one thing I would argue is by broadening access to computer science education, you will have less of the case where someone is involved with a team but has little or zero practical experience with programming, which is something which happens more often than I would have thought. Um, it is, it, uh, talking to my friends in the industry, I'm surprised how often uh, important projects involve uh, you know that the management and the decision making on important projects involve people who have no experience with uh, programming. So I think that's one thing. I, I think we need to better distill what the important parts are of this cultural context and what the less essential parts are. And I do think that our courses can do a good job of getting some of the culture of what we're doing, some of that positive culture about you know how do you solve problems in groups? How do you split up problems so that you actually can have this feasible situation where you have you know that a problem can be separable in some way that actually makes sense? I think it also would help that there are a lot of interdisciplinary projects that are happening right now. Um, one uh, project, or one program I work with at NSF is uh, we have this uh, research traineeship program for graduate students. And it's a lot of it is about uh, trying to get students to work on data-enabled science and engineering and other kinds of projects. And often it says, let's take something from this project, from this science, and work with the computer. But it doesn't work well unless the computer scientists know something about the domain science, and the domain scientists know something about computer science. So I think it, if we get to the stage where more people are know something about computer science education, that will improve, I think, communication rather than hopefully make it worse. But maybe I'm being optimistic in this case. Dutch, you want to follow up on that at all, or are you good? Uh, no, that, that, that's, a, that's an interesting angle and a question I hadn't really considered. Um, no, I think I'm good. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, I know <clears throat> Jeff has to leave in a few minutes, so to avoid uh, uh, keeping him late, we should go ahead and start wrapping up. So one thing we always ask our, our guests is if they have any shout-outs, is there anyone you want to thank or any resources you want to point us to? So um, for me, uh, so I've, I've been on leave for a little more than three years, and it will finally be coming to an end in... Uh, a little less than a month, so I'm. Uh, so I want to say first, thank you to all the people I've worked with over within NSF, but really more the actual people in the computer science education community. The the people we work with do a shocking amount of work. For you know, they get they certainly get some credit for it, and in some cases, you know, they get money for it, right? We give out grants. But they do an incredible amount for not that much return. So that I would uh, particularly note. I'd also want to thank my department here at Duke. They're, uh, uh, Duke is a wonderful place with some very interesting people. And uh, I, I, I think my time at Duke has really taught me that we have some really good resources and really good people here. And that um, I thank them for letting me have the opportunity uh, to go out and learn more about what everyone else is doing. Um, and uh, yeah, I particularly I, and thank everyone who's listening to this as well <laughs> because uh, I appreciate uh, appreciate your attention. Thank you, Steve. Do you have anything else? 
I just want to thank Jeff for coming on. That was uh, absolutely fascinating, right from start to finish. So uh, this this is great. I, I'm teaching data structures in the fall, and I'm going to be thinking hard about what you had to say. Yeah, yeah. Well, trust me. When was your semester start? I'm going to be looking at your course. So because I I know that you've been teaching you've been teaching data structures more recently than I have. <laughs> so I don't want to uh, do something which is out of date. Um, yeah, that's the other thing I hope we can do in computer science is I feel like the gap between practice and education. And I don't think what we have to do has to be always practical and tied to industry, as I said earlier. However, um, particular sometimes in the upper division, like I feel like what we do there seems to have it's, I mean, what you do in an operating system, of course, has changed since I took it in 1991 or whatever. But it hasn't changed anywhere near as much as systems research has changed. And I think we need to think about the level of abstraction that we're addressing and, of course, what things we're going to take out of our curriculum in order to make that happen. All right. I'm very well, confident what we can do that <laughs> in a more positive way. Sorry. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Jeff. And uh, Steve, did you want to lead us out? Is there, is there any, like, parting? You, you actually had a parting question. Do you, are you not going to ask it this question? Oh, no. What's my parting question? Did I, did Who, I lose Who's something? the best teacher you've ever had? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's, who's the best teacher you've had? doesn't have to be CS. Uh, best teacher I've ever had. Um, so in college, um, there was a course, Basic Electronics, E40, <laughs> taught by Gil Masters, um, that I, I wasn't that interested in op amps and, um, circuits, all that much. But it was a really, really good course. It really got me excited about how a big course can be run and how you can have a vision that's really compelling to the faculty on down. And at the same time, I don't know if it's the same semester, I also took this course from Eric Roberts on um, computer science. It was a computer science education research seminar. And I feel like those courses kind of made me think, hey, I might want to do this computer science education stuff for a living. So I point those out as two really good courses. And at the same time, oddly enough, there was an uh, African American literature at the same time, which is where the, it was like, you know, there were like 120 people in the course, but the professor knew like each of us and would like ask questions to us that that like those three courses I feel like combined put me on the cor course that I'm on today. So. Great. Right. Thank you. Yep. All right. Well, thank you again, Jeff, for joining us. And uh, this has been another great episode of the CS Education Zoo. Um, Will and I don't know exactly when we're going to be back for our uh, for our listeners. Uh, we're we're going to get that out to you soon. Uh, but we've got uh, we've got the next two CS Education Zoo episodes cooking, uh, and we'll give you more information soon. Keep an eye on Twitter uh, and that sort of thing, and we'll keep you posted. All right, Will. Anything more we need to do? I think that's it. Thank you once again, Jeff. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. And thanks, Dutch and Adrian, for joining us. Thanks, Dutch and Adrian. <laughs> okay. So far, uh, so long. Uh, till next time. And of course, uh, oh yeah, I guess we should mention to Jeff that um, you know previous guests are always invited as part of the uh, you know the peanut gallery of people who, who joined in. You, you might find me in here typing in <laughs> questions in the next week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that'd be great. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. And, thank you. Uh, until thank next you. time. All right. Stop in the broadcast.